Welcome and thank um, you for joining today's web conference, Market Surveillance Committee meeting. Please note, at this time, all audience member lines are in listen-only mode until the Q&A portions of the call. At these times, if you would like to ask a question over the phone, you may dial pound two to place yourself into the question queue. If you require technical assistance, please send a private note to the event producer via the chat panel. With that, I'll turn the call over to Benjamin Hobbs, Chair of the Market Surveillance Committee. Benjamin, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the MSC meeting. Um, on the agenda today, we have two very large issues, um, uh, congestion revenue rights auction efficiency, looking towards uh, the next um, uh, phase of the, that proposal, and then um, in the afternoon, we'll be talking about the day ahead market enhancements. Um, which has a whole uh, complexity of issues, including interaction with fracking and others. So this will be uh, probably the first of uh, several discussions that the MSC will have on this issue. Um, so, but before we get to the, the major items, um, I'll first ask for public comment on, um, on other issues, issues other than on those on the agenda unless for some reason you can't participate in a later discussion. And uh, we'll also have a vote on some minutes. So at this point, um, first within the room, I'll invite anybody who has a public comment on any issue, but preferably an issue that's not on the agenda later. Uh, there are no hands up in the room. So operator, can you see whether there's anybody on the phone lines who has a public comment or question at this time? At this time, we do not have any callers in the queue. As a reminder, pound two will allow you to enter the question queue. Okay, thank you. If there are no comments at this time, um, we'll go to the next item in the agenda, which is um, uh, consideration of the general session minutes from our February 2nd meeting. And um, the minutes, the members have the minutes, have reviewed them. I move to, to adopt them. Okay, so uh, 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 Jim Bushnell has, uh, has uh, moved that they be accepted and Scott Harvey has uh, uh, seconded. And if there are no corrections or comments, there seem to be none, I'll call a vote. Jim? I vote yes. And yes. Scott? Okay, thank you. So the, the minutes are adopted unanimously without change. Okay, we'll now move into the uh, first major item on the agenda, and uh, we have uh, per Perry Savidio who's going to be uh, giving a review of uh, congestion uh, revenue rights auction efficiency and the, the next step in the ISO's uh, reforms to that. All right, thank you, Chairman Hobbs. I'm um, Perry Servideo. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this first portion of the CRR discussion, I'll, I'll focus on um, where the initiative is right now and tee up a couple um, discussions that we could uh, that we could have next week at the working group, and also wanted to get um, the the MSC's um, brains going on on some of this stuff. So uh, just, a, just an update on where we are. We have our track uh, zero process changes. This is, this is ongoing. Um, we are looking to pro per perhaps provide an update on those in the next straw proposal for this 1B um, track. Uh, track 1A, which were measures uh, that we could implement in time for the annual condition revenue rights process. Those were adopted at the March 2018 Board of Governors meeting, and we will be filing with FERC this week. I believe we're still on track for filing uh, at FERC tomorrow. Um, today's topic discussion is on Track 1B. These are measures that we're pursuing that could be implemented in time for the 2019 Congestion Revenue Rights Settlement, uh, and we're targeting a June Board of Governors meeting for these changes, so we'll ask that you continue to uh, work with us on, on um, tight timelines. Just to give you a sense, we'll be having a working group on that next week. Uh, the following week will then be a straw proposal. Uh, the following week will then be a um, conference call on the straw proposal. Then the following week or two weeks later, you'll have your comments due, and then we're gonna move right into draft final proposal after that. So we're gonna move pretty 
pretty quick on track 1B. Uh, and then track two is still out there, uh, and that'll be potential comprehensive changes in addition to track 1A and 1B, and those could target uh, condition revenue rights implementations for rights in 2020 and, and beyond. All right, so track 1B, I kind of um, covered it at a high level on the last slide. Um, we currently fully fund congestion revenue rights, meaning that the full difference in the congestion components are paid to the CRR holder. Um, in order to do this, we uplift the shortfalls to meter demand, um, and these shortfalls have accounted for almost $200 million in consumer charges over the past four years. So I, you know, I should note, though, that our census is that LSEs that do participate in the auctions uh, have been able to offset these charges for their consumers uh, for the most part. So this is in, in contrast, this idea that you have an uplift to metered, uh, straight to meter demand for all, um, uh, basically for all FTRs um, is something that I believe we're the only ISO that does, the, we're the only ISO that does the fully funding uh, approach. Uh, other ISOs, um, uh, they have the shortfalls shared among auction rights holders, so it's shared among the, the CRRs in some pro rata type uh, method. So auction rights share in payment shortfalls, and auction rights don't provide complete hedges to their um, to their uh, uh, holders. So what we want to do in 1B is consider approaches that could be implemented fairly quickly after receiving a FERC order, and um, that could be. Uh, related to settlements, which means we have a little bit longer of a timeline to implement because they would have to be ready for January in 2019. So there are uh, certain partial funding approaches that uh, may disincentivize model gaming and highly speculative behavior in auctions. Currently, you know, like I said on the last slide, we fully fund our concession revenue rights, and in a sense, um, the, the existence of the uplift to the consumer um, is essentially a, an uplift to holders of allocated rights. So you have really these two classes of congestion revenue rights. You have a fully funded auctioned right, and you have basically a partially funded allocated right. And allocated rights on the same constraints as auction rights, that what this means is that those those two rights could be on the same constraint and, and they will not receive equivalent payouts on, on that constraint. So the idea is if all of the rights uh, share and shortfalls appropriately, then all rights flowing on the same constraint uh, would receive a fair portion of the shortfalls uh, accrued on those constraints. Uh, where constraints are mostly purchased to game the model difference or on a low-cost speculative basis, under certain partial funding approaches, and we'll talk about perhaps two of them um, today, and I know that uh, Mr. Harvey wants to talk about another approach this afternoon. Um, these CRRs would be charged for their fair portion of, of, of the shortfall. So that's, that's really what we're, what we're targeting here. So when you go down the path of, of partial funding, there's really two buckets that, that the approaches fall into, and you could either do it prior to uh, the day ahead market, do some kind of derate to the quantity of congestion revenue rights, or you could do it after the day ahead market and you're doing a derate essentially to payments to the congestion re uh, revenue rights. Um, in either approach, though, you're, you're shaping the congestion revenue rights uh, payouts or quantity to the hourly granularity of, of the day ahead market. And we, um, we pay, you know, we currently settle these things at an hourly granularity. So, um, what, what happens is if you can do it in, in an ex ante way, if you can do it prior to the day ahead market, um, then, and just derate the CRR, uh, megawatt quantities. Uh, it would allow market participants to adjust forward energy positions prior to the day ahead market to be consistent with their final um, supply delivery hedge. So the idea here is, you know, allow the market participant a chance to react to the D rate in, in, the, in the right that they bought, you know, a month ago or, or in some cases a, a year ago. And under uh, an approach that you can do prior to the day ahead market, 
you could have, uh, there are uh, certain approaches would allow for incentives for higher bid values depending on D rates. In any of these approaches, market participants, you would anticipate that they would bid less for less of a hedge, right? So the, the thing that strikes us is, well, if we can do this in a way that we don't hit that as hard or there is an incentive to keep the bid value up, we would want, we would want to go towards that type of approach. Now, in your after the day ahead market um, bucket, you're still shaping the payouts to an hourly granularity, um, and you can align them with the revenues actually collected in the day ahead market, and uh, it would be exactly to the collected revenues um, in the day ahead market, and you also have the potential to eliminate incentives here under, under an ex post approach to gain the model differences between the congestion revenue rights market and the day ahead market. And I'm going to I'm going to get into these a little bit, but I, I see MSC ready to jump on it. Oh yeah, I was just I, I don't know if you've heard things already, but um, maybe in the coming uh, days and weeks, I, I'd be curious as to what stakeholders say about the value of the ex ante versus ex post, because I, I would assume that the big value of the CRR is on a longer time frame than daily, anyways. Uh, to support a longer run, um, either supply contract or financial contract that's, that's more than just single day. And so even knowing that your CRR is going to be cut, uh, before the day ahead markets run is still going to affect like your five year contract to some degree. Uh, and I don't know, I'm sure there's some value in, in knowing going into the day ahead market. It just seems like in terms of what the CRRs are meant to support in terms of long run arrangements that there isn't a big difference between the two, but maybe I'm too focused on that longer time frame. Yeah, so there are different variations of the, the approach that I'll talk about um, the, this morning. One of the variations is you don't necessarily have to do it the day prior. We, 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 we start there because we know then we can shape it to the most accurate model that we're going to have going into the day ahead market. Um, you could back it out. Ooh, almost, okay. You could back it out a week or or two weeks, um, but in those in those scenarios, then you're trying to find what the worst case model is going to be, and you may give everyone even more of a haircut than you would give them in, if, if if you were to just do it the, the day prior to the day ahead. Okay, so you have you have the two buckets. You have a prior to, and you have an after. I saw a question out here, Kelly. This is Callie Wells with WPTF. Um, you might be getting to this in, in your next couple of slides. Do you have a sense of where the, I, the other ISOs fall into these two buckets? Do you know how many do ex-ante versus ex-post approaches? Yeah, um, all of the ISOs do ex-post approaches. Uh, I believe there's one exception in ERCOT, but I'm not sure if it's just an advisory type thing prior to or if they actually settle it um, or, or if they actually do the the actual D rate in, in, the, in the day prior to the day head market. Still, still trying to figure that, that piece out, but I'm, I'm pretty confident in saying most of the ISOs do this ex, ex post. So this is probably a good time for me to ask me, both you and, and Scott, I guess, as well, about um, um, you know, the simplicity of things like PGM's haircut approach and, and others. So is this in general, um, this partial funding, has that been highly controversial, uh, not at all controversial? Are folks revisiting that in, in uh, some markets because they're perceived to be problems? I mean, how, how do stakeholders and the, the operators and others uh, feel about that in other markets? Well, I think that actually there hasn't been much proration in any place other than PJM because they basically set the target so that they're, they are fully funded. Uh, so that as far as I know, PGM is the only place where there have been material uh, haircuts. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, it just, you know, sort of how the thing is described, uh, but it ultimately ends up being fully funded. I'll have to go back and look, because I can't think of any place other than PGM where there's actually been significant haircuts. And that was, you know, you know, un made some people unhappy and other people not unhappy, so. But in terms of revisiting and saying, well, we should get rid of haircuts and fully fund, we don't see any anybody in any ISO saying, well, we're considering that. They're, if they've got partial funding, they're sticking with it. And, 
and are not so unhappy with it that they're pushing for changes. Yeah, yeah, I think at some point in the past, um, ERCOT looked into moving more towards uh, a fully funding type uh, approach, but I don't think it was the full blown like like we have. Okay, full, full so ERCOT might have changed. Um, so I have another somewhat different question. So in um, in our opinion and um, in uh, the the previous uh, track 1A, the emphasis was on change in the auction so that you get, um, um, you award rights that are uh, less likely to result in, well, both uh, revenue insufficiency and in uh, in these losses. And here's, and here's another way to get at it, just re reduce the payouts. So I'm wondering if there's, you know, general information about what that would have done, for example, to the average 70 million or whatever it was per year over the last eight years that were losses. If this had been in place, would that number have been 60 million or would have been 10 million? What, what difference, do we know that yet? Yeah, I can give you maybe like a, a static kind of look back number, but again, the 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 haircut it's the amount of the haircut required or the amount of the uplift required today is dependent on the the amount that they're bidding for the CR so as soon as you do a partial funding approach they may bid less for the CR and then I'll have more you know more of the I would have had more maybe more of an uplift over the over the past year but I'd say about half of that 200 or so million dollars in the past four years you'd say it, it would have been split about half and half among auction and, and allocated CRRs. Okay, thanks, Barry. You're, you're absolutely right, of course, about bidding, that the bidding would be less because they'd be less valuable, presumably. Jim? Yeah, I was just going to say I, I, I'm still trying to get my head around how much of this is about the traditional revenue inadequacy problem versus the auction uh, shortfall issue. Because certainly if, if the bulk of the auction shortfall is directed at very low-priced um, CRRs that are on unmodeled constraints, then this, I think, does tackle a lot of that. And, and you wouldn't see much of a reaction from bids because the bids weren't that high in the first place. Um, but it, it's, it seems like if, if, if it was a constraint that actually was modeled but just sold for a low price, that this, this wouldn't um, address that issue. It would address the, re the revenue inadequacy, but it wouldn't necessarily target that. So we still need to understand sort of which of those flavors of auction shortfall problem is dominant. And it, it, it seems like it's the low price sales, but I think we still need to understand that a little better. Yeah, so what um, I guess what I'm hearing is it might be good to go back and look at in kind of the big blow ups over the over the past four years and then um, see how the how the how the payouts among allocated versus uh, auctioned would have would have split out, and then among the auctioned, if they were the lower, you know, lower bid value um, uh, CRRs that are getting hit or not. Yeah. So, because it sounds like Jim, if I understand that your hypothesis is is that uh, <clears throat> if if that would, would trim payouts to mainly very low priced or, or rights or rights that weren't bid very much for, then of course you couldn't see much of an impact on bids. But on the other hand, if it was uh, relatively high bids, then the bidding revenue is more likely to be affected, and so. Okay, some texture there would be useful to see. You got that, Danielle? <laughs> She's been really good at getting uh, getting a lot of data together. Okay. <clears throat> Don't want you to be bored. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So under either, and I think I just I, you know, said this on the last slide, but under either approach, whether you do it prior to or after, um, the ISO, essentially what that is, the ISO is not going to be paying the CRR holders for the full quantity of the CRRs uh, that they bought as of, you know, the month, the month ahead or the, or the annual auction. So what this means, and we just talked through this, the participants will likely lower their bid values in anticipation of lower payouts. So we're actually attracted to any approach that might uh, not result in a, in a complete um, uh, in a complete degradation of, of bid values. So, kind of the open the open question that we explore is, you know, are there any partial funding approaches um, that would reduce uh, the incentive for market participants to lower bid uh, lower their bid values in the auction? And we've identified uh, within the two buckets one uh, one 
One example of, of, of an approach for each of the two buckets that we think might not uh, have as, as big of an impact on, on bid value as, say, just doing a, just doing a straight, you know, um, peanut butter uh, proration of, of uplift across, you know, pro rata to, to payments. As opposed to targeting particular constraints that had big payouts and the rights that. Yeah, so one of the approaches, the second one that we'll talk through, is the ex post approach is, is targeted towards the, you know, specific down to the constraint, and we think that's probably within the ex post approaches, that's probably your best best bet at, at targeting those low low value, uh, low bid value um, CRRs. Okay, so do we, I should maybe pause for a second to see if we have any questions on the phone. We have a caller in queue. Please go ahead. Hi, Perry, this is Colby with ETAL, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing well. A couple of questions for you. Um, the first being, well, and I, I kind of have to address this because I'm not quite sure exactly what equation you're using and how you're getting to this number, but you mentioned that there was a, there's been a loss to load over the last four years, and I'd like maybe for you to talk to exactly what, what that is and how you're coming to that conclusion. Um, as sure. We talk That's for, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, and these are just, just preliminary, but you just add up the uplifts that's, that have been directly charged to load. So that's the result of uh, the shortfall when you add up congestion rent plus auction revenue, how much still needs to be uplifted to load. Okay, so it's not taking into consideration that's any the, costs associated with the product or any value associated with the product whatsoever other than the revenue. Could you could you repeat that last one? It's kind of you sound far, further away in the, in the room here. So, sorry. So that simple equation is not taking into consideration any costs associated with the product, or any value other than the revenue component of the product itself. Sure. This is just what was direct. Yeah. I'm just yeah. Okay. You're, you're right. Okay. I'm just quoting okay. what is direct what was direct uplift to load, and I note that usually, uh, well, the sense is that the LSEs that do use the auction are more than able to compensate for that direct uplift, uh, their portion of that direct uplift. Or, or the LSEs that do use counterparties to transact with in the marketplace that use the product to offer hedge products would obviously indirectly benefit associated with it and therefore wouldn't be involved in that calculation. So therefore, it could be right, somewhat. Right, right. This is just the, the same. Right. I just, I just, I guess I want to get to the fact that that when we say that's a loss to load, we don't actually, we can't actually conclude that being the case because there are a lot of indirect benefits that could be benefiting the market, and we're really kind of being disingenuous as it relates to it being a loss to load. But that that being said, we can talk about this a little bit more next week. The the, the other couple of questions I had for you. Um, and you, uh, one being an answer to, I think, what you had a question as it relates to um, other alternatives. But the first one is um, the ex-ante approach. Could the ex-ante approach be a – could you actually have a situation to where you curtail congestion revenue rights on a day-ahead basis and then still not have an underfunding issue and have an overfunding issue and if so, where would the overfunding issue, where would the overfunding go as it relates to that kind of situation? And then the last question. Sure, let's, let's get into that on the, on the next slide. Okay. Then the last, last one would be um, for the partial funding you mentioned. And I, I looked through your slides very briefly, so I apologize if I'm jumping forward on this one as well. Um, one of the things that I think could possibly get traction at FERC um, is that the transmission owners have some accountability, a financial accountability as it relates to the partial funding, meaning that when they don't um, go through a transmission outage process and transmission outages are ca uh, categorized in certain ways that could have been avoided or were out of time and, there, and therefore the risks associated with those outages could put a burden on load right now. Um, 
what about the Cal ISO also doing an evaluation and determining whether or not they should have, quote, unquote, a stake in the game, the transmission owners, instead of moving those costs right now from the transmission owner companies to load um, in the uplift process, they would actually be accountable for any kind of avoidable transmission outages, um, outages that could have been delayed until the next month, and therefore in the um, monthly auction uh, models, things of that nature. Yeah, I'll, I'll make one note, and I think <laughs> Dr. Harvey probably knows more about how it works uh, um, in New York, is it, that does the, the transmission, uh, allocation of transmission owners, but my, just my first thought, and maybe we can you know, kind of hammer through this at the working group next week, is that the way that it's set up right now is if we charge the transmission owner that, in effect, then is just passed straight through to the to meter demand, just like it would be if we charged the the load serving entity today. So, it, in effect, there's no real there would be no real difference in in the behavior of the transmission owner as long as it's a pass through. Yeah, and, and, and that may, you make a great point there because a lot of what has been said and speculated is this is a loss to load as it relates to these, you know, undervalued CRs and things of that nature. But there clearly is components outside of outside of just people picking up cheap CRs and so forth. But there's clearly components that could be um, changed or, or or processes that could be changed. And I know Cal ISO is going through that process right now but could maybe take a step further in really um, uh, reducing this, you know, this perceived loss to load. But I do believe that we, we could talk about it next week, but I do believe that accountability in all situations uh, typically uh, forces people's hands to do the right thing. And uh, we, we really should focus on the transmission owners and therefore the utilities and therefore the folks that are serving the load have some level of accountability to what they're costing load. Uh, Dr. Harvey, did you want to add anything? Well, I, I'll, I can talk a little bit about New York. Uh, in theory, the cost of the outages is allocated to the transmission owners, and then it's passed through in the uh, the TSC to the rate payers. However, because of the way the the rate structure is actually structured for the transmission owners, there's some regulatory lags and there's incentives. So actually, part of the impact does fall on the shareholders of the transmission owners. And uh, we did appear to see a significant change in behavior uh, when we put these rules into effect, uh, where the consequence of getting an outage done in 10 days instead of five days fell partly on that transmission owner. And uh, the part that didn't fall on its shareholders fell on the ratepayers. It seemed that we saw a, uh, an acceleration and, uh, you know, doing outage when, when there's control and the outage is doing them when it, when, uh, demand is low and the cost of an outage is low. Now, now that goes the opposite of the direction where some people want here, where the transmission owners are supposed to tell, specify everything four years in advance. If you look at the New York tariff, you'll see they get huge discretion to take advantage of if they see low load, low weather coming up to do a outage on the spur of the moment as long as the ISO clears it. And to, uh, so that's, you know, a possible approach, but that's a much, that's a big, long discussion and change to implement it, but that's how it kind of worked in New York. Scott, is that mechanism limited to planned maintenance or do unplanned outages also sort of factor into this? It doesn't deal with real-time outages, but anything that's out in the day-ahead market is taken into account. So if it, if it goes out uh, and stays out for a week or a year, it, it you know rolls into the impact. So, uh, Scott, you said it did appear to make a difference in behavior and so forth. Is there documentation, something interesting for us to read about that? No, because I did the calculations using a lot of data that's very non-public and you know, for various reasons. All right. So I, I just we'll, we'll talk more about that. I mean, that's we, maybe we could do a segment on that at the working group next week. And, and Colby, uh, if you know a lot about the methodology that they use, that's what we would want to um, really dive into at the working group. Because if it's an extremely complicated um, kind of cause-based methodology to, to figure out which transmission owner to charge 
to, to send the bill to, then um, I, I, I'm not completely confident we can, we can get that before June, but definitely next, next Tuesday is the place to start that conversation. Thank you, Colby, for the question. Are there other questions on the line, operator? Yes, we have two more callers in queue at this time. I'll open the next line. Thank you. Hi, this is Doug Bocignone with Flynn Resource Consultants I'm for Silicon Valley Power in Sydney County, San Francisco. I have a question or clarification about slide four, the second bullet, about sort of two classes of CRRs. I just want to make sure I'm understanding it. Is the, the idea that because load pays to fully fund the CRRs in effect, that makes the auctions CRRs fully funded, but the allocation CRRs not only partially funded? But the idea. Yeah, that's, you know, the general point that we're trying to make here is if load is who is getting the allocated and load is also getting the entire uplift charge, then it's as if we're you know, giving a, a less of a hedge to the allocated CRR than we are to the um, auctioned CRR. Okay. But the shortfall isn't applied proportional to any specific allocation. Sure, right? sure. So that's a bit um, disingenuous. I don't know. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I get the point, but it's not like the rights themselves are different. True. Yeah, we, we don't we don't allocate them, you know, back the uplift back per right, the uplift goes to, you know, pro rata to demand. That's why I'm saying in a sense it's so the, the idea here is that under under a future partial funding approach we could align these the these these two um these two different rights. In fact there there'd be potential issues if you didn't, um, in terms of having like two classes of, of CRRs and what that would imply. But are you considering having two buckets? So you'd have one bucket to fully, or to partially fund, I'm sorry, to fully fund the, the auction and a separate bucket for the allocation? The, so what we're walking through today is, is, is really, you either do the, the ex ante or the ex post, and in, in both of those approaches, you treat all CRR holders exactly the same. They would all share in the, in the shortfalls in some proportion be to, their, to their CRR holding. What would be the ramifications of having separate buckets? I, I'm not. I, what do, could you maybe explain what you mean? I think well, he's proposing, thinking, let's say you haircut only the auction CRRs, but not the allocated ones. So you have two different classes of CRRs. Is, swing, is that swing what you're the implying? pendulum the entire opposite direction then? Well, or, or have each, each class take care of itself. I mean, maybe this only matters if you're going down the route of having a peanut butter approach. Um, but it, it just seems like you could have, you know, a different mix. The allocation CRRs may look a lot different from the auction CRRs. So if you are spreading these costs to do the funding, you know, maybe it would make sense to do you, have don't swing all the way or to just create two separate pools to keep it fully funded. Yeah, if, do you, if you have a, a particular approach in mind, I don't have it in, in this presentation today. We could, we could talk about this and, and um, if you plan on coming to the working group next week, that might be a good, a good place to put, put it out there. Okay, I'll think about it. I'll, I'll be at the meeting next week. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Um, operator, do we have another question? We do. The last question currently in the queue. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Eduardo Gill with Calpine Energy Solutions, and uh, it's a quick question. I, I just want to know if there is a list of constraints that are currently uh, underfunded or overfunded, and, and, and also if you guys publish any information on flows on those constraints. 
I'm, I'm not aware if that's out there right now um, to support any, yeah, to support the proposal, we, we, we'd go as far as maybe look digging into some specific uh, constraints, but to get the information for all of them, uh, I'm not sure if that's going to be uh, completely possible because you'd have to figure out the, what, what the CRRs themselves would have placed, what flows the CRRs themselves would have placed on the, on the day ahead um, model to figure out if, it, if the flows were over what you collected in the day ahead or under what you collected in the day ahead. And pretty sure we don't do that today. Got it. Okay. Hey, Perry. Yep. Okay, thank you. This is Jim uh, McLean. Uh, Guillermo's group does post uh, their monthly performance uh, report. Actually, Abhishek uh, does a lot of that data, so there is some information out there at least. In his, uh, in his monthly report, he has the select, kind of what I'm talking about is you look at the, you look at the, the big blow-up constraints and you just deep dive into those. So he does, I'm not quite sure of the methodology he uses though, but. Gotcha. It's just like, a, you know, expectation and actual, and compare the expectation with actuals just in, in that sense. Yes, we don't post uh, the detailed deep, deep dive, but we do post the revenue inadequacy or adequacy by transmission element, and that is on a monthly basis. Okay, we'll, we'll follow up with you um, with an email on, on where you can find that. Okay, thanks. I think that takes care of the line, unless there's somebody else. Uh, one more, please. We, yes, we have had a new caller enter the queue. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Bruce Blowish from DC Energy. Uh, Perry, earlier in the presentation, did you indicate that only CalISO has fully funded FTRs? Yeah, our understanding is that most most of the other ISOs do some sort of, of uh, pro rata or or um, portional payout on on CRRs. Okay, because or FTRs. I mean, I mean, FERC went through a proceeding and came out with Order 681 that all ISOs had to come up with fully funding mechanisms and file them at the commission. So they all have, in effect, fully funded FTRs. It's just a matter of how each of the ISOs actually implement that fully funding mechanism. And I think Scott spoke to the New York process, um, the New York ISO, and, you know, the transmission outage, our observations are that the transmission owners have the incentive to manage outages so that the FTRs are, or well, the TCCs in that case, are fully funded. Can I uh, just get a definition of what fully funded means? Because <laughs> I, I, it may not. I, yeah, I think I see the the confusion here. So, fully funded is for in in the sense that I'm talking here is that the the auctioned CRR holder is made whole on on his entire megawatts payments due to due to him. Um, in other ISOs, those holders take haircuts on their on, on their on their payouts. And it, and it result and those haircuts then result in a fully funded um, CRR. Fully funded here, though, is you get the full value that you, uh, that you bought in the in the monthly or annual auction. But am I correct, Scott, that New York also has the same mechanism where the TCCs are fully funded on the backs of the transmission owners? Yeah, as I said, there they've always New York has always had a fully funding mechanism, and you're also right that Order 681 required all ISOs to fully fund FTRs. It just gets complicated because some of the ISOs uh, complied with Order 681 in ways that actually, you know, according to the language of 681, FERC said it constituted fully funded, but it didn't really fully fund it. So it's it's a little murky. There are there are some ISOs where, in fact, there there is proration of the payments, even though they say they're fully funded. Uh, but I don't think it's most. I think it's uh, a couple of of cases. But I'll, I'll have to go back and look at what the current uh, check with a couple of people. But 
Yeah, and I guess I'm still confused as to whether fully funded in FERC's mind is the same definition as what fully funded that Perry has articulated, which is uh, for a specific CRR, the revenues are guaranteed uh, by, or the quantity of the CRR is guaranteed. Um, and and I, I didn't know if that's what FERC's definition of fully funded means or if it's something more at a system level rather than at a CRR specific level. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's the confusion here. So the, this raises the question um, <clears throat> just in terms of the, these possibilities that you're laying out, Perry, whether all or some would be would uh, be allowable under 681, or whether some would uh, run afoul of that, which is which are legal judgments. Um, but I guess it's also important to understand what the spirit of Order 681 is, and what what FERC would like to see, um, and what the what the concerns are as well. Even if we uh, comply with the letter of it. So I, I, I'm, I'm completely naive on on these issues. Uh, but presumably in the proposal, there will be a discussion of this? Uh, yeah, I, I'll clarify the, the definitions uh, as they pertain to the, the specific proposal. With the aid of counsel, presumably. With the aid of my counsel, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, we, we did talk about this, um, but I'll, I'll hit it. So the first bucket was to try to do a D rate to the uh, quantity of the CRR at some point in time prior to the day ahead market. Uh, so the way uh, logistically this would work is that uh, market participants would purchase CRRs in an annual process, purchase CRRs again in a monthly process, and then every single day of the year, the day prior to the day ahead market, D minus two, if you will, the the S will we would basically rerun the simultaneous feasibility test and use the bids from the monthly process to derate the CRRs according to their bid value. So process wise, you get derated prior to the day ahead market, that's your coverage, that's your hedge coverage going into the day ahead market. Um, you come out of the day ahead market, we would pay on uh, those adjusted quantities to the uh, to the CRRs and the final adjusted quantity and they would be shaped to the hour, if that makes sense. So, uh, you know, for, for a little bit more flavor on that, that's really running 24 models every day because you're going to shape it to the hour. So you could, you'd run 20, you'd, you'd basically run the SFT 24 times, um, each for each hourly model. And you don't have any of the same, uh, Intertemporal uh, constraints that we have today and today's day ahead market, so you can you can run those in parallel if it gets down to an implementation issue. This be prorating the entire CRR down, or would it be prorating down the the CRR flows in that particular constraint? It would be prorating all of the the, the cumulative CRR flows on the constraints as of what what model you have as of the, the day ahead market. So no no entity would get more CRRs as of the daily process, the daily adjustment process. It would only act to cut people's CRRs and that would be uh, based on their, their bid-in value. Yeah, I was, I was asking a slightly different question. Suppose a CRR created flows on five constraints, one of which was overloaded. Would you then prorate that CRR down to eliminate the overload on that one constraint, but prorate it down so that it would also eliminate, reduce the hedge on all the other constraints that weren't overloaded? Or would you just reduce the payment on the overloaded constraint? Yeah, another way to put it is, are you just re reducing the quantity of the point to point, or are you reducing the payout specific to you know constraint by constraint? Okay, yeah, no, this would reduce the quantities point to point, it would still try to maximize, you know, the quote unquote auction revenue from the from the daily adjustment process. So where, you know, in effect if, if something was placing flows on a on a transmission line that's now out of service, 
it would readjust all of the CRRs to be feasible on the on the new model, on the, the network model as of the day. Right. So if I had 10 CRRs, you'd reduce the, my CRRs to eight. You wouldn't just take away the revenues on the the, the constraint is infeasible. I'd also lose my two CRRs hedge on every other constraint. Right. We you would have. We would now, once the adjustment process is done, you'd have eight megawatts or you know eight CRRs, and uh, you would be settled then on those on those eight CRRs according to the prices from the day ahead market. Question, Kelly. Hi, this is Kelly Wells with WPTF. So I'm a little confused on. So you're saying that you would reduce the CRRs based on their bid value? Right. So you utilize the latest bids that you have as of the monthly auction, and you're basically sending all of the CRRs into the auction again every day, and you're using those, bid that, those bids to readjust the CRRs such that you're only hitting your lowest valued CRRs with the D rates. So I guess my follow-up question would be then, how, what bid value would you place on the allocated CRRs since they're just nominated? Right. So the way that this would have to work, uh, you have to either choose to have the allocated CRRs be the highest priority or the lowest priority. And what we have here, the thought is to make them have the highest priority in the adjustment process. So you put them in at some extremely high uh, bid value so that they would be the last CRRs that you hit. So you're going to hit, hit all of your, your auction CRRs kind of through this process, still trying to maximize the, the, the quote-unquote auction revenue from this process. And where that still can't solve it, you would then be starting to dip into the allocated CRRs in, in, in certain areas. Yeah, so back to the earlier discussion, there is kind of two classes. Of there would be two CRRs. classes. Under this. Um, so, and just thinking this through, let's say there is a, a CRR that's purchased in the annual process, or a seasonal CRR that had a certain high bid, but then a sliver of it is sold for one month at a lower price. Does it carry with it the high, you know, initial sale, or is it sort of reset? Um, I'm looking at Jim. So we, we did have one discussion on this. In the actual details of a proposal, if we were to fle really flesh this out, I think where this would end up is that you would there'd be this priority of you'd hit you'd run all of the month leads together. So you're, if you want to set up this, this uh, think of this as a priority system. You'd be hitting auctioned monthly, then allocated monthly. Then if you needed more, you'd have this, you'd bring the annuals in, but bring all of the annual allocated and auctioned in together and keep hitting those. Then you would hit annual auction, then annual alloc allocated. Because you want to use the bids from the annual process as well. Okay, I, I'm just trying to think about that. That makes sense to me when, when we think of the monthly auction as clearing additional capacity that's made available. But when we think of it as sort of transacting already allocated or sold capacity, that gets a little more murky to me. Yeah, so under the, under the 1A approach, it, it will literally be a sale from one, you know, from one CRR holder to another at a price. So someone did buy it at a positive price, and therefore that would be the bid value of that CRR going into this process, whatever their bid curve was to purchase that, uh, yeah. But so that does raise the, the concern that if an allocated CRR is sold like in an, a monthly auction, it's kind of de reducing its priority then. Um, I mean, sure, but to, to what someone was willing to pay to purchase it in, in, the, in the monthly auction. Okay, so why go down this road? Well, it's still the, the reasons that, that we evaluated, you could still, uh, there's still this incentive to not completely devalue your bids in, in the auction. You would say, this right is very important for me to have. So I'm bidding, and that's why I'm bidding more for it. And that means those, if you're bidding more for it in the monthly process, then you have, you have the higher likelihood of keeping that, that full hedge. 
Um, that's, that's attractive to us because there is that incentive to, to keep your bid value up. Uh, we don't think that it would, you know. Just a second. You, 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 are you prorating based on the bid value or the clearing price in the auction? I thought you said you were clear, you're prorating based on the clearing price in the auction. So I could bid high, but it could still clear at a very low price. So which which did you mean? Did you mean prorate based on the clearing price or the the bid in the auction? Jim, did you have when we talked through this? I, I think the sense was that you're still using the the bids right. from the monthly process. You're still running the SFT like you would normally. So you're you're basically going to just assume that these are the you still have a limited amount of capacity. So you have a, you have an even more limited amount yeah. of capacity now in the day ahead. Yeah. And then the question is, well, who gets hit? So the idea is, you know, if you're trying to maximize that quote unquote auction auction revenue in the daily adjustment, what you're going to end up doing is positioning the CRs in a way where you're only reducing the lowest lowest value ones anyway. I think that's the idea. I might be missing something. Not prorating based on price. You're going to rerun the auction and clear it with the bids, but with less transfer capability. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we would do that 24-7, 365 every day. But that's so, just for purpose of allocation. You're not going to actually set new prices out of those auctions, right? Yeah. Yeah, there wouldn't be new prices out. It would just, the, the result of doing that every day would be every every CRR holder would have an adjusted CRR quantity, and that adjusted CRR quantity would then be what we settle on um, after the day head market, settled hourly. So I don't know if anybody could be so clever. So I guess ideally, uh, if I wanted a particular ride, I'd like to get a low price. So you'd like the clearing price to be low, so the last accepted bid to be low, but all the previously accepted bids you'd like to be really high so you don't get get cut. And right. So if you happen to be one, the only bidder for a particular right, that might be a possible strategy. Bid high for a few and then make sure those don't get cut, but make sure the price is set by others. If there's that sort of market power, okay. I'm not sure that's even a problem, though. I mean, so you're buying a portfolio of a certain amount of low priority rights and a certain amount of high priority ones, and you don't really know where the market clearing quantity is going to be. But. Yeah. Okay, and then from uh, what Colby was saying earlier, or let me first, what I, from what I was saying earlier, uh, you, you, you started saying that the ideal is to do this every day. If you, if you don't do this every day, you back it up, you know, let's say one week, and you say, I'm going to then shape my CRRs to kind of a weekly granularity by doing this thing every week. Um, you know, going beyond that, I'm not quite sure if it makes sense to go down to shaping it to the to the two week. But the ideal is you get it down to the hourly every every day. You you lose some of the efficiency in this, and you're actually going to end up taking more more head, uh, more of people's hedges away the further back from that from the day prior to the day head market that you go. Okay, I think. Shami, you say we have two two callers? Yes, we do have callers on the phone. Please go ahead. Hey, Perry, Bruce Flyway, DC Energy again. So this ex ante approach would be applied to both allocated and auctioned CRRs, but the priority would be for the allocated? Yeah, so the, the open question that, that we had in our mind was first, okay, well, allocated CRRs, they're not bidding in, right? Uh, the process is set up such that they get the first, they get the first take at it. Um, so the question that is left then is, well, what, what does the allocated CRR bid curve really look like? Is it a, just a really high, high price or do you put them in at the market clearing price and let them be the, you know, the, the first hit, if you will? And what, what we landed on here uh, to get the conversation going was to, you basically put them in at really high prices. So they would be, they would be hit last. 
but there would still be the potential for them to, if you will, receive a haircut as well and not get the hedge for the entire month. Right, right. They would, yeah. If we lose, if we lose a large line, I'm pretty sure you're going to be you're going to be dipping into the allocated CRRs, and you're going to need to haircut them just in order to have a feasible solution. Thank you. And I'm I think there was one more caller. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, uh, it's Eduardo Gill from Calpine Energy Solutions. Just like I, just for the sake of transparency, uh, would you publish this new reduced transfer capability in the SFT, or that would be something that we wouldn't have visibility on? So we would be using. Can you can you clarify timing for me? What so the the way that this process is set up is that. To, let's say we ran this thing today on, on April 5th. I'd be running it for trade day April 7th. And you know that trade day April 7th, day ahead market's going to happen on April 6th. So where in that process are you looking for information? It's actually like, uh, in my mind, after the fact. Let's say that the line has a thermal limit of 500 megawatts, but you have to derate it to 300. That, that, that's my understanding of the process here. Uh, I would like to know after the fact that that happened. So, but I don't know if you would, you guys would be willing to publish that kind of information. Either. Yeah, we can maybe talk that through at the working group next week. Um, we, we, the plan is to definitely publish the adjusted CRR quantities because you want to give market participants the chance to react to that prior to the day ahead market. Um, so those would definitely come out right after the uh, the, the, da the daily run of this, if you will. Um, then you're saying you want you want the full uh, model, or you're just looking for what what what, what were the big um, constraints that 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 you want to be able to back into? Well, why do I have an adjusted CRR down? Is that the is that the concern you're getting to? It's, uh, I think it's like, um, you know, to have an idea of how much the D-rate is, right, to, you know, have a feeling going forward of how much the system is going to get D-rated uh, because of the issue of uh, underfunding. Uh, some, like, let's say you have a 500 megawatts line and you D-rate it to 100, that, that's a big D-rate. So, um, for that reason, now if you D-rate to 400 or 450, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. So in this approach, yes, it's a it's a the line is derated, but we would re-clear the CR so that the flow on the derated line would only uh, the CR flow on the derated line would only be the 100 megawatt limit in whatever um, in whatever hour. You'd want to know which line or you know what caused the the derate is like, that the information uh, you're looking yeah, for well it's just like i'm i'm just looking for like a, a feeling an idea of how much you're shrinking the system let say like uh, does that make sense yeah so i mean i think yeah so i i think realistically then what you're looking for is a, is a daily full network model so that you can look at you know which outages yeah. on the system cause which adjustments to CRRs, right? Right. 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 Okay. Well, maybe we can bring that up at the at the working group next next week. Yeah, you're you're only going to derate uh, what binds, right? You're not going to be derating what doesn't bind. Uh, does that make right. sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. All right. Cool. What, what I just remember the discussion we had before. You're going to derate the CRRs. So if your CRR, if your monthly CRR had some flows on a constraint, it could get completely eliminated, even though you you bought it to head something completely different. And if we prorated all the alloc all the auction CRRs and the monthly auction before we did anything else. You know, potentially any CRR, no matter how high you bid, could get prorated to zero. And even if it only had a 1% a or 2% shift factor on that constraint. That's one of the reasons that using the bid values um, 
we think works better when you do it prior to the day ahead market and, and some time frame rather than uh, if you're using bid values and you try to do this ex post, then it's like, boom, I'm sorry you lost your entire CRR and you're just hearing about it after, after a day ahead market. There's no chance to, to react to, to losing the hedge. You'd still lose the entire CRR if you did it ex ante and you know you. If that was the contract, if that was a generator source, you're using to hedge your load, you'd still lose it all. Yeah, that's a fair point. I see. Okay. Thanks. All right. So that was uh, just the high level of an ex ante approach, and we can maybe um, deep dive into this approach and um, some variations on this approach at the working group next week. I wanted to then hit, uh, for, the, for the MSC's pleasure, uh, an ex post approach um, that would be, uh, that we think we, we might be able to implement uh, in time for the settlement in, in January. So now we're in that second bucket. We're gonna do something after you're done with the day ahead market. Um, so what we're doing under this approach is that you use the, you use the day ahead market flows on all of the constraints and you use the, and then you figure out the CRR market, or the CRR flows on those, on, on that day ahead model and you're doing this after, after the day ahead now. And you're comparing if your CRR, uh, flows were above the day ahead market flows, that means I'm paying CRRs more than I'm collecting on the constraint in the day ahead market. So that's what I'm trying to represent in the blue and orange bars here. In, the, in this example, I need to pay out some larger quantity of CRRs than, we're actually, than we actually collected in revenue in the, uh, in the day ahead market. So that would be a, that re results in a shortfall. Um, under this approach, you specifically target to the specific constraint, you figure out all of your all of your overpayments, and you hit all of the CRRs that are effective on that constraint. It's very, it's, this is the scalpel approach to doing something ex post. What you see in other ISOs is just pro rata to total payments, kind of over the month or over the day or over the hour. What this is is it says, well, some CRRs are really effective on certain constraints, and those, if if the CRR holder was targeting those those constraints with the CRR. Uh, these, these CRRs would be the one that would be hit. So in effect, what that means is uh, if you have CRRs in Southern California and it's a, it's a great day, sunny, California, sunny Southern California, nothing's happening on the system, you're still, you're still hedged um, and you get up to, and you're still hedged even if there's a big uh, constraint binding up in, up in Northern California. Those would be the, the CRRs that would be hit the hardest. This would be the, like I said, the scalpel approach to, to doing something. How, how, is this different from the first approach? So you're not going to use auction prices to do the proration? Right. You don't use auction prices. You use shift factors and megawatts. And then you prorate the payments. Okay. And I'll, I mean, this is, uh, this is an is approach. This, this, the shift factors be the same priority so you, First, use the shift factor, anything with a shift factor on it, the monthly auction, then any in the monthly allocation, then any in the seasonal auction. And yeah, that would be an interesting spin. I actually hadn't thought of that, but this was just, you have a final set of CRRs that month, and they're all, all of those CRRs would be placing this kind of flow on the, on the day ahead model, and we would then look at the, the overage and just charge back to those CRRs that are effective only to the point where it brings us right to in line with the flow of the day ahead market. So should I be thinking about this still though is that you're reducing a megawatt, a megawatt hour of CRR or it seems like the, the concept that's been floated is an alternative in which we think of a CRR as a bundle of payments on a, a bunch of constraints and you could maintain the CRR fully on the constraints that aren't being eliminated or being affected by the adjustment and then only reduce the payment assigned with the shadow price on the constraint that changed. Is, is that what you're talking about here? Yeah, you could actually, I mean, that's a good point. You could actually represent this as a, as a 
uh, in terms of, of megawatts on the constraint or in terms of payments on, on the constraint. You know, revenues collected on the constraint versus revenues I need to pay out to with CRRs that would flow that, that were flowing on the constraint. We had a question out here. Yeah, Mary Lynch with Constellation. So does this mechanism still require you to, um, does it still have a priority for the allocated rights holders versus the um, auction right holds, rights holders? Yeah, I don't believe this would give any priority over uh, uh, allocated or auction. This would just look at what's the most effective CRRs to that constraint and then cut those compared to each other. I, I will mention that, um, so this one is, is, is after the fact. So what you do under this pr approach, especially when it's the scalpel, is there's, you essentially eliminate all opportunities to, to, to game the model because you're only going to pay out on, on the final model and on, the, and on these final um, constraints. And if it was a CR that was specifically targeting a, 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 you know, a model difference, then that's going to be the CRR that's going to be hit the hardest. Why do you say that? Why would it necessarily have the, the highest shift factor just because it was? It was targeting a huge pay, a potential huge payout on a model difference. It's going to try to have the highest shift factors to that. Well, it might not. It might, might try to have the lowest shift factor on the auction model and a higher on a higher shift factor. Yeah, I have to think that through. I think what we want to do on on this one as well is go and look at some of those big blow up days, and, and that can really flesh out if we think it has to do with a model difference uh, issue or a um, low bid value uh, high high payout issue. Okay, we could go to the go to the lines. All right, going to the first caller in queue. Your line is now open. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, how are you today? Hi, I'm good. This is Danielle Dooley with the Office of Ratepayer Advocates. So um, I just wanted to confirm two things with the scenario that you just described for the ex post payment. So you're essentially, are, um, very essentially arguing that you would only fund CRRs up to the revenues generated. So it doesn't matter like what you paid in the day ahead market, you're essentially only going to get whatever congestion revenues were actually collected. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. I, I have a little bit of a, of a footnote on that, but I'll let you, I'll let sure. you finish. Okay, and, and maybe that footnote will be answered in my follow-up. So based on that, um, you see this as essentially helping to solve the revenue inadequacy problem because there's no uplifted shortfall. Is that also correct? Is that the footnote you were going to talk about? Yeah, this would not end up in, in any up any of the additional uplifts to load that we have today. It would instead uh, charge these, you know, these shortfalls back to the CRR itself. So the, everyone's CRRs will not, will, will not pay out as much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. What and the footnote the is like that, that, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, that was it. I was just asking what the footnote was. <laughs> yeah, okay, so then, then the footnote is that you will have, um, you will have some uh, transmission lines on the system where the day ahead market has more flows than the CRR flows would have been. And, and in those instances, you will have collected, essentially collected a surplus. So this is targeting ones where you were definitely over on the constraints and we take back all that money, but I would still have this bucket of surplus for any of the transmission lines where my day ahead market flows were higher than my CRR flows placed on that, on that same model. We would then need to hammer out what do you do with this, with this surplus? Do you try to then go back and make everyone's 
CRRs whole at the end of the month, at the end of the week, or, or what to do with that, with that surplus money? Okay, yeah, and, and, you know, I was wondering that question myself, too. So are you going to make available any of the reports or any of the information for these proposed Track 1B changes before the stakeholder meeting next week? Uh, I don't think uh, we would try to incorporate any any of the data into the straw proposal itself. Any okay. of the data and that we do, find. Do you have a date for the straw proposal to be released? Mid-April. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. No problem. Is there anything else on the line? Yes, we have two more callers still in queue. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, it's Eduardo Gil from Copine Energy Solutions again. Just a follow-up question on a question I asked uh, earlier. Why wouldn't you uh, simply derate the thermal limit of the lines when you run the auction? So that, that would allow you to, like, to you know, reduce supply and perhaps like avoid underfunding. Uh, I, I believe that other ISOs uh, do that. Yeah, so today we're at 75% um, of lines in, in the annual process, and we're about at 82.5% of line ratings uh, in the monthly process. So the suggestion is to uh, lower those. Um, it's, that's, you're right, I, I, I believe it would help. It, it's definitely more of a, of a sledgehammer, hit it with a sledgehammer and hope, uh, and other ISOs do that. Um, but it also, I, I'll, I'll talk on the next slide. We have a bullet. We're, we're still keeping the releasing less capacity in the annual auction um, on, on the table for Track 1B. I, I believe they pick and choose, though. I believe they choose which ones they want to uh, derate more and which ones they would derate less. Oh, but I'll derate wait. specific constraints. Yeah. yeah. I believe they do that. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe they do it. <laughs> Constraints. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that take that note. So have some methodology to identify a trouble constraint and then just derate that constraint. I so yeah. already do that. Jim, did you have a comment on that? I, I th well, this is Brad. I just thought it seems to me the problem is we wouldn't know which ones to pick. You know, that's that's kind of the real problem. It's gonna be problem different problem. every day. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to the extent you know about an outage that's been scheduled, you're modeling it, right? If you find out in time. So what we're talking about is the ones that you didn't find out about in time, right? That's the oh, you're saying apply this in the ex post process. Apply it. The, 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 the caller was suggesting why not model this in the monthly auction if you know that there's going to be a D rate on a specific line. And I think, as was discussed in the, the early report, to the extent the ISO knows that there's going to be an outage when they run the seasonal or monthly auction, they do model it but that we, the issue is the ones we don't know about in that time frame, or that we, we find out in, in that time frame but we don't have enough time to incorporate it in the model, that we find out two days before the auctions run and it takes five days to work out the contingency. And I think that, that's the situation we're talking about, right? Uh, as well, yeah, that's as well. I, I thought that perhaps you could go back and even in the annual watch and have an opinion about which constraints might be um, underfunded in the future, but um, it seems like it could be challenging, right? Like, so. I think the CAISO does that. Don't you do that for the external timelines? You make judgments about how much they're going to be derated based on past outages? Jim, you want to? Sorry. Yeah, there's, there's a break-even analysis that's done on an annual three-year basis and even on any internal lines that have been derated, which is you don't really get, you're either out or you're in. You don't get a whole bunch of data that way, but, but you're right. For the interface stuff, we definitely do a break-even analysis on. I see. I see, because it, it, it's also a function of how volatile the shadow prices are going forward, right? Like, uh, um, but, but fine, okay, that clarifies my question, thanks. All right, thanks. Is there another? Two more. It seems like every time I turn over, there's two more, two more, two more. Okay, okay I'll answer quicker. All right, we'll go to the next caller. 
Hi, just <clears throat> real quick comment. I think that slide eight, um, Terry, is uh, how ERCOT actually implements their their um, uh, CRR market. Okay, uh, we'll look into that. I know, I know they do they do a lot of things um, different from the way that we do it, and um, I know that. They do, uh, they have a specific uh, scalpel such as this, but only for certain CRRs in, in their portfolios, and then they, then they apply this over um, this, this pro rata to, to payments. But, but you are right, they do something similar to this, but only for certain CRRs, I, I, I believe. We're, we're still looking into that. Okay, thanks. I believe it's just their resource. Uh, any CR that involves a resource node, they apply the this scalpel um, payment, ex post payment reduction to them. Eric, what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do we have two more callers? Uh, we have one more caller at this time. Please go ahead. Hey, Barry, Bruce Blow, SDC Energy again. And I was just wondering if CalISO has given some thought to these approaches and how they will affect the ability to hedge congestion overall. Um, you know, what will this devalue the product? Will it not devalue the product? Those kind of thoughts about can people get the hedges that they really want going forward? Yeah, so that's the that's the struggle is is whenever you start talking about partial funding, you're going to have some devaluation of the product because it's not, you know, quote unquote a full hedge for for the purchaser of the congestion revenue right. Um, so that's why with the the two that we talked about here today, the first one kind of gives you a way to perhaps not hit bid values as as hard because CR uh, participant uh, auction participants. Would bid more for the for the rights that they are absolutely valuable to them that they can't lose, and and you would only then hit the lower value ones. Under this approach, the idea is if we're specific and targeted to these to these constraints, this really targets the um, the the low value, highly speculative CRRs with huge payouts um, on these constraints, and then also this this one particularly uh, targets model uh, model gaming. So the idea is you. Okay, I get hit model gaming and low value speculative CRRs and it, and it won't have as big of an impact on the overall um, CR product. We were just trying to think through also there's there's the point that if if this is calibrated correctly, there's the argument that uh, the CRRs that are getting reduced are exactly matching the physical flows that have to be reduced to respect the same network model. Uh, now, I think to the extent the CRR allocation matches the actual dispatch, I think if there's disparities, then it's not going to line up that way. But we're just thinking if you had just a two-node model um, and you reduce the capacity on that line, then the actual power that's flowing over the line has to be reduced as well. And so the hedge kind of is moving with the change in the physical flow. Right, right. And just one follow-up. I mean, I'm... I'm Maybe I'm asking a question you've discussed in the past. I'm just jumping in because that's on vacation this week. But, you know, you've talked about the modeling differences in the gaming. Why not just eliminate the modeling differences? Or if that's something you've already discussed. We've been trying to do that for 10 years. Okay, sorry. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's a 16-hour, it's a you know, time-of-use model that's and my day ahead market is 24 different models. I mean, I, it, it's impossible, first. Second, I, it's impossible even if we knew all of that information. Second, we're never going to know all of that information as of the time that we run the auctions. Okay. All right, and then um, that was, you know, the, the previous caller was kind of this good uh, segue into other approaches under consideration in track 1B, uh, lowering the percentage of system capacity release in the annual congestion revenue rights process. We're 
um, working on an analysis for this. You might remember this from track 1A. Uh, we originally proposed 45%. We're not quite sure we need to go that low, but we're doing analysis. We're going to keep that on the table. Uh, we have the Department of Market Monitoring uh, and Southern California Edison proposal to eliminate using the available transmission system in the auction. This moves towards this, this willing counterparty uh, approach. And I believe that SE plans to come in and propose this at the, at the working group next week, so I don't want to steal any of their thunder on that. Uh, and then the other idea floating out there um, is to implement reserve prices. You could do, you know, and we haven't put a ton of thought into this, but you could do a point-to-point -point, uh, reserve price based on historical day ahead market congestion between each node. So now if I have some 80,000 uh, node pairs, for every node pair I'd have a point-to-point -point historical day ahead market uh, congestion between the two, and I would make the reserve price equal to that. What and then um, we have uh, data analysis on the impact of auction revenue, shortfall of low price congestion revenue rights. Um, that could help in, in, in setting uh, uh, the appropriate reserve price. You, just to give you kind of, the, so the pros are, okay, you might juice your auction revenues, but it's a hope you juice the auction revenues and then, or juice the auction revenues and then hope that the money kind of works itself out. Um, and the other kind of con, if you will, to this is if there's new transmission coming in service over the course of the year, I'm, I'm, this is always looking backwards. It's not looking uh, prospective. So if congestion could just disappear, you know, mid-year, mid and I'll still have this higher uh, reserve price on, on, on the point to points. So, Perry, the idea of just having some de minimis reserve price that applies to everything. You know, it's got to be 25 cents or whatever. If you viewed that as too blunt an instrument, you'd rather see something refined like this. This sounds like a lot of work and, um, yeah, as you say, looking backwards as opposed to forward. I, I would at least, you know, want to not appear to have pulled a price out of the air. You know, we'd have, we have to look at, so that's why we said, okay, I can do, what I can do is look back three years and go point to point and figure out what the congestion was between the and then have this table of of point to point with floor prices and you and you let them go into the auction and you just enforce those so some fraction doesn't have to be hundred percent but yeah the event just having a simple thing twenty five cents or or dollar or something <clears throat> um the 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 problem is it might knock out um some uh rights that rights wouldn't be allocated that have a low value but um, it would discriminate against in on a ratio, uh, in terms of the ratio of the, the tax or the uh, reserve price to uh, the value would penalize low value rights, but then those are ones that people are less likely to care about too. You know, high value rights won't be so harmed. That's uh, actually but, a good point. You can, you know, we see that the large portion of the problem are the, are the if you really want to target the low value, high, high payout um, CRRs, you put a reserve price in. And uh, presumably, then they wouldn't they wouldn't clear, or it would clear at a higher value, and we collect more uh, auction revenue. Mean, remember, 888 did have reservation prices for transmission. So it's not. Tell tell me, yeah, what sort? Of Just used to work. You bought, you paid the the transmission charge, and sometimes that's why sometimes it was way too low, which is why you're still putting it at 12:30. You know. One minute before midnight. Remember the race to do it by the seconds, but there was a minimum price. Um, so, continuing with this, is there are there any um, plans or, or thoughts about simulating the impact of this, given historical bids, similar to the the simulations of the other ideas? I'm, I'm seeing you smile. I'm in the looking for anyone to help me on <laughs> the. Anyone that would have been here that could give you an estimate on if that's possible to simulate is not in the room right now. So, well, wouldn't I mean? Uh, isn't assuming that bids don't change, isn't this as simple as throwing out the rights that sell below a certain price and just eliminating the revenues from them and eliminating the payouts to them? Well, let's see, so there's declining demand curve, and so you'd eliminate on the margin some. Do you eliminate them all? Well, if the willingness, willingness to pay was below the 
threshold, yes. But if um, the bids were, some of the bids were above. Okay, so you're saying the, the uh, if we throw out bids below a certain level, it might actually raise the market clearing price bunch of uh, CRRs? Yeah, well, some, lower the market market price some price of the low price yeah. ones will still clear, but at a higher level to cover yeah. basically at the, at the threshold. <laughs> so uh, I encourage the ISO if it has resources to be able to do such an analysis. I think it would be quite interesting to see what the impact would be on the auction outcomes and then, of course, the, uh, the loss and all the other uh, metrics that we're interested in. But, you know, academics like to recommend further research all the time. Okay, so it would be to, or to, and I think you guys put this in your last opinion also, it would be to rerun with the price floor and actually march that all the way through. You do the annual, you do the monthly, uh, and then you actually go into the month and you do the final settlement on them and see where you would have, where you would have landed, right? Okay, I captured the note here. I'll wear my. Um, Couldn't do all that. It would still be informative to just rerun one monthly auctions or some monthly auctions and see how it would impact that. Some data would be better than no data. So not to have to do all five years or whatever, but yeah, I think even to see impact on, on auction revenue themselves. How much do auction revenues go up? With right, because if auction revenues don't move a lot, the, the simple analysis of just throwing out the net loss from sales below the threshold would actually be a decent approximation. It is a it's a lower bound than what. Someone on the line with their uh, phone not on mute. Lauren, can we make sure that the loans are or the lines are muted? Okay, there is no background noise coming. It's coming from the room. All lines are muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Not this room. No, we we have no lines. Everybody, turn their lines off. Okay. Well, we'll see. The call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's good. I, I believe this was my last slide on yep. on this topic. Yep. So thank you for all of the um, good ideas to consider. Points on this, like on the first one, you know, you could. Uh, still allocate 75% in the monthly allocation process and then set that limit in the auction so that you'd only sell up to 45% in the auction, but release the constraints so where you'd oversold in the allocation, you could sell some additional. So, you know, that's uh, another variation on that. If you wanted to still allocate uh, 75%, but limit the amount that you sold. You wouldn't necessarily need to uh, set the same limit in the, uh, in the in the auction. And other ISOs do that where they've under where they've over oversold. They do relax the limits of the ones that are oversold when they uh, reduce, uh, you know, model outages and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be a variation on that. Uh, you also, if you just wanted to eliminate the loss to the LSEs, you could just limit the, uh, the participation in the auction to load serving entities, right? Yep. And let them, uh, but have, allow them to have free access to the auction. Uh, I'll do one last phone check. And all uh, your line is unmuted. Hi, Perry. It's Colby again. How are you? Hey, Colby. Thanks for the presentation. I guess I have one quick question. Um, maybe it's not quick. Maybe it is. Um, we talk about it in a lot of in-depth analysis, uh, what presented by the MSC uh, questions pertaining to really analyzing um, the, the, the product and so forth. One, one of the things, again, I, I kind of get back to, and I just heard it a few seconds ago, we talk about this loss to 
to load. Um, have we discussed uh, within the ISO um, or with an outside consulting firm or anything of that nature in really determining whether or not we have a problem? Meaning that do we actually have a loss to load or are we just, are we going down this avenue, which again, I, I think we proposed portion of this to you guys prior to track 1A, um, but it would, so we don't mind a portion of this, but I, I do question, first off, should we allow some of the changes to work? Secondly, are we solving for a non-problem or solving for a problem related to an equation that is incomplete? And if that is the case, are we at all going to look at trying to determine what the real equation is and determine if we really have a problem? So is this the um, determine the benefit side of the of the cost benefit question? I mean, well, yeah. I guess that I guess I have to say that because multiple multiple conversations in this discussion we've talked about this loss to load, but in reality, everything we've talked about is the difference between day ahead congestion and revenue. We haven't talked about a loss to load at all. We've just talked about an equation that doesn't take in, into consideration many costs around collateral, holding costs, everything of that nature, and we haven't taken into the equation anything related to the benefits, everything from market power issues to open access to transparency and liquidity, all sorts of different things, hedging capability, uh, risk mitigation. Uh, we have, you know, so I, I just, I have to say that because, I mean, if we're all sitting, we have very intelligent individuals sitting up here talking about this stuff and we're talking about how to mitigate this loss to load, but we're not even determining whether or not we actually have a problem. So, uh, yeah, I guess that, sorry, long-winded answer to your question, yes. Yeah, no, I'm not, I mean, we have not uh, engaged in any outside um, help on trying to flesh out of the, you know, the, the benefit side or, or this equation. Um, maybe what we, what we could do is, is meet up with you guys to, to flesh out what you feel that, you know, equation on that benefit side should look like to see if those are actually things that we can actually, you know, go and find, uh, go and quantify. I think the idea is if you do a study um, like this, you have to be able to quantify things, right? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I know this is very difficult to quantify, and I, I also want to make sure that we recognize that not only is there a potential remove of benefits, but there also is an introduction of costs. So, for instance, when we look at removing biddable paths as it relates to the Track 1A, well, not only could we be, and I'm not suggesting we are, not only could we be removing benefits, but we also could be inter, uh, introducing costs to the marketplace, introducing costs to load. We could be shifting costs. We could be doing all sorts of different things. We just don't know the answer to the question. But um, we'd be happy to sit down and we'd be happy to brainstorm, especially with the, the stakeholder uh, meeting coming up, um, how to address this because I, I really feel like we're, we're you know, going, uh, you know, we're, we're going down a path in which we're making all these changes, but we don't even know what our real problem is and we don't even know whether or not the changes that we're making could actually cost the market more money. Um, from one bucket to another. And I, I think that that's um, not the proper way of, 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 of doing this. Yep, that, that's a fair point. We'd have to look into what, you know, what ways there are to actually quantify those, those things. Thank you. Um, so this is, this is Ben. So if the bids are, uh, the willingness to pay for the uh, auction rights are a reasonable approximation of the uh, of the value to the market, then one can look at the decrease in net surplus um, in the auction. This is the objective function of the uh, of the auction. If you don't allow some bids or re or restrict others, and we did poke around at some of those those numbers uh, before. Uh, that's a problematic measure, but it might get at some of what you're talking about. Well, and I guess this is Jim, backing up to a higher level, I, I guess I would just phrase your point a little differently that I think we do know what the problem is in a sense that there are load serving entities who believe that they are experiencing a shortfall 
Now, uh, your argument, as I understand it, is that the fixes are eliminating beneficial uh, aspects of the market and that the costs overall could be greater than what the perceived problem is. But I think those are being borne by different parts of the market as well. So that's another aspect of this. Sorry. Go ahead. If you could be quick, we have one more thing that we need to do before lunch. So oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I a follow up. Yeah, I think that's partially correct. I think that, but the the, the, the I, maybe I've heard this incomplete, but I think that there are a lot of different factors. I think there's factors as it relates to non-speculative rules, as it relates to the PUC. I think there's factors of moving costs from the transmission owners to load that are being accounted for in the net efficiency equation, but are being pointed back to as it relates to, you know, uh, market participants making money off these products, but they're actually being driven from outages and transmission process, you know, that are, that are done inappropriately, done incorrectly. So, I, again, I think that there's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle, and I think what you mentioned is exactly right. This is a perceived loss because nobody's accounting for the value associated with products, the products in the marketplace. So it is a perception, and the perception is being dwelled on, and the perception is being, um, you know, is permeating around the marketplace, but without the real, without understanding what the realities are, without understanding the values associated with all of this into the market, how these play a role in in all of the different products that are offered, and the you know non-competitive versus competitive load mo load you know competition that's going on right now with respect to um, direct access to all of those different pieces of pie. So, I, 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 yes, it is a perception right now, and unfortunately, that perception can't be substantiated because there's no there's 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 nothing that points at a definitive load is losing money. Load could actually be benefiting hundreds of millions of dollars right now, but we don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Colby. Appreciate the comment. And I think at this point we should move on. Unless there's did I see a hand, a twitch of a finger in the audience? Okay, uh, let's take the question in the queue. Hopefully we can make it uh, short because we have one other thing we want to do before lunch. Thank you. Okay. Operator? Caller, your line. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hi, it's Justin here at uh, Calpine Energy Solutions. So, you know, j just just uh, reiter reiterating Colby's, Colby's uh, comment that, uh, you know, absent the ability to publicly, publicly or quantify um, uh, certain benefits, and it doesn't mean that they're not there, and uh, we, we see those benefits as a load-serving entity. Thanks, Justin. All right, at um, this point, uh, Jim and I have a, a, a short presentation. Um, um, the um, SCE DMM alternatives and some of the issues associated with that. So this is partly um, developed as a uh, subsequent discussion from some of the discussions that were uh, started at the at the board meeting um, where, you know, up till now, uh, most of our uh, bandwidth has been focused on identifying where the revenue shortfalls has been and, and some of the ISO proposals. And uh, we, we have been trying to think through what the implications of the, let's, we're just going to call it the SCE DMM proposal. I recognize that there's a lot of load serving entities that are supportive and, and have different variants of these sorts of things floating around, so that's short. Uh, shorthand for the general approach that's been uh, floated, sometimes described as the voluntary auction, and we'll get into that. So uh, we've always had uh, some concerns associated with it, not to say that they're not um, insurmountable, but uh, that I think they do need to be addressed at some level. Um, the first, and, and I've been trying to sort through these, and I basically categorized them into three uh, categories. The, what we'll call technical issues, which has to do with um, the sense that the allocation process and the auction were, were designed 
as a whole, and I think there are elements of the allocation process that would have been developed differently if we'd have known from the start that we weren't going to have an auction that happened after the allocation. Um, and it really raises the question of whether the allocation itself would need to be redesigned if we just sort of cut off the second part of this uh, joint process. Uh, so Ben's going to talk about some of the specific concerns that arise out of that, that, you know, has to do with are there certain types of CRRs that just could not be formed? Um, are there other issues? Um, the second category would be institutional issues uh, having to do with the, the, um, the, the fact that some of the large recipients of CRRs, the, particularly the regulated LSEs, face limitations on um, their ability to participate in the auction and certainly on incentive issues that influence, influence their ability to participate in the auction. Um, and these have been commented on already, and so I think if we are relying on the voluntary resale by the, the parties that are getting the allocation to inject CRRs into the market, uh, we, I think, have to confront how serious those institutional issues are and, and which we, uh, whether there's solutions to them. Uh, uh, you know, part of this is the, I think there's a disagreement on exactly how, uh, how many counterflow CRRs, if you want to call it that, or third-party CRRs that uh, would be made available by firms that, that are just sort of offering naked um, uh, counterflow CRRs into the auction. They're not receiving a, an allocated CRR, but instead would be taking a financial position that would be uh, increasing their risk, but they're willing to sell it off to somebody else. Um, I think if, if you do believe that there's a lot of this potential out there, then, um, then some of the technical issues are less of concern, but um, I, I just, we are less convinced than, than some that there's a lot of this potential uh, sort of naked third-party um, counterflow that would be offered at, uh, at reasonable prices or certainly they would be offered at higher prices. Um, and I guess there's also the revenue inadequacy issues that would not be solved by just going to an allocation. They would just be housed within LSEs then. So there are still some LSEs that would be getting uh, rights that are more valuable than other LSEs and there would be some LSEs that would be getting um, CRRs that have higher payouts than the revenue coming in, so there would still be uplift that would uh, be an issue that would be dealt with. It would just be an equity issue within the community of LSEs uh, rather than uh, across LSEs and other participants to the auction. So I, I think some of the questions and some of the design issues that we've been going over really are still relevant even if we didn't have an auction because it still affects the, the equity within the LSE community, if nothing else. Um, and then the third, this is, uh, you know, the ISO uh, gets entertainment value out of us taking legal uh, opinions, but um, we, we, this is not our expertise, but certainly th there are differences. We've seen them in the stakeholder comments about exactly what we, dif what, what is viewed as open access. And I think one side has, has characterized this as, well, look, the ISO lets anybody who wants to bid into the daily market. And so, you know, ISOs are, are open and, and anybody who's willing to bid uh, can use that system and that's a definition of open access, but there's certainly other definitions of open access that have, have to do with um, being able to buy something that's uh, in advance of just the daily market, um, which uh, could be characterized as uh, more of a firm transmission access uh, to the extent, in, if we take the natural gas analogy, if you just show up and buy gas on the day of or day before, um, it's a form of non-firm. And if you want to buy something uh, on a longer term horizon, we would call that firm. And so are the um, CRRs are by many stakeholders viewed as a form of firm forward transmission access. Yes, it's true that anybody can access the market on the day of, but um, access to CRRs at reasonable prices is a form of forward access that I think still needs to be resolved. Uh, now, you know, this proposal doesn't eliminate CRRs, or the DMMSE proposal doesn't eliminate CRRs. It just uh, eliminates um, a certain amount of the uh, available transmission capacity that is left over after the allocation process. Um, and as Scott brought up, there's actually a spectrum here between the 
uh, the status quo, which takes the full, if we're talking about the annual, takes the full 75% uh, of, of all constraints, and anything that's left over after the allocation process is, is eligible to be devoted to an auction CRR. And our understanding of the SCE DMM proposal, which is essentially to take that amount zero, uh, so that the amount of available flow on each line would be uh, constrained to be only that that is uh, selected in the allocation process. And as Scott was mentioning, there's a spectrum there. We could go uh, all the way up to 75, or we could stay at zero, or we could do some uh, something in between. All right, so uh, I, today we wanted to just focus on the technical issues, because um, I think that they are maybe less controversial, um, or at least we wanted to clarify, because I don't think we've really dug too deeply into them in previous stakeholder forums. Um, so the, the point is, is that the, the voluntary auction proposal, the proposals as we understand them, would basically uh, set the flows over each constraint equivalent to those implied by the CRRs emerging from the allocation process, even if those flows are well below the 75% transmission that was made available in the allocation phase uh, or that is uh, available in the auctions today. Um, and so I, my intuition to this is that we're essentially locking in the flows and the capacity that emerges from the allocation process, and that raises questions of whether the allocation process is the right sort of framework for, for defining what the eligible CRRs for secondary transactions should be, and that's where concerns over the restrictions that are placed on the allocation process come in. We uh, restrict certainly relative to the auction today and even relative to the proposal uh, that was adopted at the last board, there are additional restrictions on eligible sync source pairs. There are requirements on LSCs to um, relate their nominations in the long term to physical sources and certainly to where their physical load is in, in all of the different allocations. And there's just a different objective function to the allocation process than there is to the auction process. It's, uh, so it's different. Um, and how concerned are we about that difference? Um, and maybe do we need to redefine exactly how that works if we are uh, relying on it exclusively to uh, create the available capacity that would be uh, put into secondary transactions? So the concern here, one way to put it, is even if there is a willing participation by sellers, um, these restrictions um, can make uh, – the uh, set of possible CRRs that could be offered into the um, into the auction very difficult um, to, to the ability to form new types of CRRs uh, in the auction out after the allocation process could be extremely difficult or unlikely. Uh, and Ben's going to describe in a little more detail uh, exactly why that could be the case. Uh, it looked like we had a question though. Uh, with the from SC, I appreciate you looking into this. I uh, just want to get a comment standing before you go further into the material. I have a problem understanding the first bullet there um, because I think an SC proposal, um, the auction itself will be independent from allocation, there won't be any restriction on you know, tied to the allocation because the option will be fully based on the winning counterparties. So I don't understand the first part of there why the proposal would uh, restrict constraint flows to those emerging from allocation process. Uh, okay. So, and again, there's we I, I get into um, semantic confusion at times. So the the point here is if we're talking about the sale of CRRs where uh, the congestion payments are backed by congestion revenues collected by the ISO on behalf of transmission rate payers. So I, I've referred to those as ISO-backed CRRs, or you can call them transmission rate payer-backed CRRs. To the extent we view those as different types of CRRs, as ones that are being bid in by somebody who doesn't have the opposite position, uh, that's what we're talking about here, is the set of uh, transmission rate payer-backed CRRs the possible combinations of those are emerging out of the allocation process. 
Now, you're right. If, if I wanted to go in and just take on additional risk and bid a, a, a counterflow CRR into the auction, there are no technical limitations on my ability to do that. But there are additional costs to me to selling that CRR than there would be to somebody who has the opposite uh, position collecting the actual congestion revenue. Because I don't have, I wouldn't be offsetting some congestion revenue. I would just be uh, taking on an additional risk position. Uh, so this first bullet is referring to the set of CRRs that are backed by, um, backed by ISO collected congestion revenue. Um, you know, and back to the previous point, I guess uh, people have sort of said, well, why, you know, it's a, it, it's a voluntary market. Anybody could sell. Um, wh what's the difference between uh, Goldman Sachs selling a CRR and, and, and anybody else or a load-serving entity that gets an allocated CRR? Um, you know, in the oil markets, people sell these things all the time. I've heard this. And, and the point is, is that the, the ISO or the transmission rate payers on behalf of the, that the ISO is collecting the congestion revenue for, they are, in essence, the oil producers. They have the commodity that can be sold in a forward market. Uh, and so they, when they sell it, there's a different risk transaction than there is to somebody who doesn't own any oil and sells an oil future. Uh, and so the willingness to sell uh, this commodity is going to be different for somebody who has no offsetting position than it is for somebody who does have the offsetting position. Uh, and that's... I know there's disagreements over how significant that difference is, but, Ryan. So, I'm sorry, just to clarify, uh, the, the proposal is you won't run the auction based on the actual physical goods capability, because anyone could, can, go to the, uh, can go to the auction and uh, do the transaction, regardless you have uh, physical assets on that. So I think that will be the CR market, the re redesigned auction market. And I think, you know, as Perry said, we will be presenting our proposal next week so you can have a full picture. But I, but, but I still okay, have we, difficulty to understand. In, in the end of the proposal, the auction by itself will be a completely financial market. It, 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 Nothing to do with the allocation in, in my mind. So, so the, uh, are you saying that uh, LSEs would not utilize this auction to resell portions of their allocated CRR? It depends. If if uh, LSE wants to do that, he can. But if it doesn't, you know, he doesn't need to. Just like anyone else, you know, you can go to the auction. You can put, buy or sell if there's a winning counterparty. So you don't need to say, you know, the flow of your CR being paired has to be below the physical grid capability. There's no linkage it was, it was from the financial auction market to the physical grid. There's no limit on how much you can transact uh, compared to today. Well, uh, okay, and, and maybe as we get into Ben's example, we'll clarify if we're misunderstanding this proposal. Um, but our understanding of the proposal is that there's no additional transmission capacity being offered in by the ISO. Yeah, that's uh, not our proposal, not as the proposal. Okay, so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to, you know, clarify that as we go on today. Ryan, did you, was that the point you were going to make? Or? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing more of the discussion will, you know, kind of clarify where there's some miscommunication or something. But, I mean, I guess I was going to say there's nothing in the SC proposal that, that prevents uh, LSEs who have allocated CRRs to then sell those back. Right. But if they're not allocated to them, then they can't sell it. So you've got a cartel and restrained trade, you restrict, you restrict what's available for sell, and then you say, oh, well, no one can buy it because we didn't allocate it. No, no, no. Hold on. So what I'm saying is that any who's LSEs have been allocated FTRs, CRs, take home, they, they But they, they only they allocated them. certain things, so you don't let them get the things that other people want to buy, and then you say, oh, no one can buy it. Oh, so they can sell those. They can sell those back under the SC proposal. They've been allocated those because they pay transmission access charge. Which right, is right. No, but what Scott is saying is a a right that isn't created in the allocation process cannot be resold because it doesn't exist. Now it could be created synthetically by somebody willing to take on that risk. Yeah, I mean, I mean, can't, I mean created synthetically. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, all these things are. I mean, the CRRs, they're just financial swaps. They're they're they're. They're yes, but this is, again, this is the, this, we're, we're trying to, we see this as there's a difference between a CRR that is backed by congestion revenue 
that is being collected and a CRR that is not backed by congestion revenue that's being collected. Okay. That the costs of selling the former are lower. In fact, they're probably negative. And the costs of selling the latter are higher, but which is what they're taking on risk. But to clarify that, what you're talking, you're not talking about the CRRs that have already been allocated. You're talking about, and what the SC proposal would, you know, would, would change would be that the limit, you know, that the rest of their capacity on transmission constraints, which have not been used up by allocated CRRs. Then that, they, that, then that would be it's those it's those financial swaps that are now that are now not would now not be forced to be uh, offered at the zero dollar reservation price. And so what you're saying is that, I, and, and I think we completely completely disagree that just because you know there's this pool of congestion rents which which would you know which would be coming in after the allocation process that have not been allocated out those congestion rents would, would then go into the CR balancing account. And, you're, and I, I think we completely disagree that that there's that there's um, that low swing entities would be willing to, you know, uh, uh, would be willing to offer those at some kind of discount to what the to what the expected payouts are, right? Because I mean, imagine, I mean, like, if, if that's the case, you're assuming then that those congestion rents, which have, which are, you know, which are not which are not associated with any allocated CRRs, that those are somehow what tied to a to a, already tied to a forward contract. I mean, I think it's it's just as safe to assume that that. But in fact, it's probably better to assume those congestion rates are actually going to be, or would actually materialize because there's load, there's new load, which is, which is being, which is being uh, uh, purchased in the day and market. So I think, you know, the, the, just the fact that there is this extra pool of congestion rates that's going to materialize in the day and market doesn't mean that load streaming industry would be willing to offer that up or sell that off at a, at a, at a, at a discount to the expected, to the, to the expected value. Okay, so I think your, your comments, again, that's why I threw this, this slide up because I wanted to try to um, organize the discussions according to the different sorts of issues because I think your last point relates to what I called institutional issues. Uh, that you're saying the, 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 the way you guys characterize this is that the auction is, is forcing the LSEs to sell um, with no reservation price. Uh, and, you know, one solution would be to introduce a reservation price. I guess what I'm pointing out here is that there are, there are other institutional factors at play that make this not exactly a fully competitive market between willing sellers and willing buyers. There's regulatory oversight. There's other types of, you know, division of risk between shareholders and ratepayers that, uh, you know, if we just threw this out and did not require any sale, I, I'm not sure that, you know, it, that's, I don't view that as the competitive market solution either. Uh, and so maybe the answer is that there's something in between forcing them to sell it at zero and not making them offer at all uh, that is represented by something like the offer price solution. Uh, and I, you know, I, I didn't bring it up earlier, but the, the there is a precedent in the form of the uh, emissions allowances that are uh, allocated, the revenue for which is allocated to uh, distribution utilities, but um, they don't rely on bilateral transactions for those, those uh, allowances to make their way into the market. They are instead consigned into an auction um, where there's a reservation price, but it's the reservation price everybody pays. But you could certainly, it, it, it could be the case that those uh, allowances are also eventually sold at a quote unquote loss if it turns out that the market value of them is higher than what the auction clearing price is. And one of the, you know, what, there are lots of institutional reasons why that was done, but there was concerns that those, those allowances would not find their way to the sources of emissions that needed them. Um, and, you know, there's similar arguments that apply here that, that I couch under the institutional category. Um, I think what we wanted to focus on here was more of the technical category, because I think if, if you set aside the institutional disagreements, and I don't want to concede them, but I just want to categorize them, then there are legitimate, I think, remaining technical issues that, um, that one solution for which would be change the allocation process. Uh, and another solution would be this is why we need an auction because it, it, it solves these, these uh, limits to the space of possible CRRs that can be created from the joint auction allocation process. And so that's how I've been trying to sort of categorize this. And I think our, you know, this discussion also comes up with if you are of the mind that there's plenty of financial parties out there willing to offer counterflow for basically the expected value of the counterflow or a small premium above that, then your concern with the technical issues is a lot lower than it is than ours is, 
but we view that there's sort of a, a significant enough gap between the willingness to sell these counterflow rights that the, the markup above expected value would be significant enough that it's very different than what a uh, congestion revenue backed CRR would sell for. Yeah, I think, and I think what, I think, I think that is kind of a fundamental issue. I think that's yeah. kind of the fundamental debate that I think everyone's having. The open access stuff, I mean, I, I think it really does come down to if somehow I, 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 the, the secondary market did materialize because people were willing to sell, would only willing to sell at a high premium. And, you know, and you guys use the terms here as, you know, in terms of is it, uh, you know, adequate. You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's, there's a question there about whether or not, you know, how, how much higher would these, would, 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 would offer prices be? Um, and how does, how, how might, how, how might that compare to the losses which loads from entities are currently, uh, forced, um, you know, are, are being forced to, 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 uh, suffer through with the Right, but I, 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 I don't want to, so again, if, if I'm a natural gas producer and I'm producing natural gas, I may be willing to sell that gas in a forward market for less than its expected value because I'm earning money for that gas, but it's uncertain money. And so I'm willing to sell it for less than that. And so a load-serving entity selling its congestion revenue share uh, for less than the expected value is not necessarily a sign of a market failure. Yeah, Jim, because what you're saying is the load-serving entity is effectively hedging that stream of congestion revenues itself. To the extent that that, to the extent that their congestion revenue doesn't exactly align with their own load position, yes. Uh, yeah, which, which, which gets the point of, when I originally pressed the button here to talk, that, that, that's, the, that's the point I'm making though, is that for this pool of congestion rents, which are, which have not been allocated, that's likely to align with, with, you know, increased load in the day of market. So actually that, that, that pool of congestion rents actually hedges them for their, Unhedged load positions, so then you know, so then so that you know they're, they're not they're, they would not be natural sellers of that of that very, congestion. Very, very imperfectly, I would think. Um, I mean, it may be correlated with it, but I, I don't see it as um, you know sort of a smear of, of overall congestion revenues, sort of being a good hedge for any specific uh, physical transaction that sinks in some place. No, but I mean, but it's all, I mean, but the, that, that pool of congestion is uncertain, and so, I mean, and so is the increase in load across, across the, you know, across the grid. Yeah. Sure. Uh, just a really quick uh, comment. So, if a low of entity or any participant wants to sell at a discount in the auction, right, if that transaction is cleared, and this, and the SE proposal, that that we pretend the winning counterparties. That means the buyer is willing to accept that, you know, whatever the price being offered in the auction. So it's still between the winning counterparties. Not like today, the ISO uh, force, if you want to call that, the low 70 sales CRs. But I think in the proposal, our proposal, what be between the winning counterparties. It doesn't matter how you, Structure your bid behavior in the auction, and as long as you have a winning counterparty to to accept the, the deal, then the deal is a deal. So right. That's okay. So, and again, the, the institutional issues are trying to capture sort of the the nuance behind willing. Uh, so, you know, uh, this isn't your company is not completely free to sell forward instruments um, without any regulatory implications and ramifications. Uh, and there are other complications that are, you know, raised by other stakeholders in terms of there are large LSEs that are getting a large share of allocated CRRs and maybe they're not willing to sell those for reasons that aren't fully, um, you know, doesn't have to do with expected value but just more to do with their strategy in the market. Uh, and so, you, you could view the idea of having an auction with some capacity as trying to overcome the barriers that limit even, you know, that might prevent a so-called willing seller from being able to or also overcome, you know, potential anti-competitive concerns that a, somebody is unwilling to sell for the wrong reasons. Yeah, I was thinking more about that point, but I think, you know, the, uh, you don't have to be allocated CRs in order to sell CRs in auctions. 
I agree with that, but do you agree that if I sold CRR, it would be a different cost profile than if, a, than if I had an allocated CRR and sold that exact same CRR? It, again, it's based on winning counterparties. If you want to sell that, and if there's a winning buyer want to accept that price, then it's a market. You then have to allocate the entire transfer capability of the grid as load-serving entities and let them decide if they want to sell it. You can't have the current the proposal, which is we're going to restrict most of it because we, won't, we don't make it available for allocation, and then we're going to say there's no willing counterparties because we didn't create a counterparty. We didn't give that right to any LLC so they could sell it. So that's the Jim's starting point was if you're going to have that kind of design, then you have to have an allocation that allocates all the transfer capability of the grid to the load-serving entities, including rights out. And then you can say, well, any of those LLCs want to sell it or not, and not have the kind of rules that restrict who gets it now so that certain LLCs get all the rights. And you can't certainly have a rule that says that no one can get some, no LLC can get some of the rights, and therefore it won't be available for sale. So you can't willingly sell something that couldn't be created in the allocation process, right? Goldman Sachs maybe could, but they would have to sell it at a higher cost and presumably higher price. That's what we've called technical issues. Again, I was thinking more about this, but I think the allocation is really tied to the use of the grid. It's a more physical nature. The auction will be financial, which means it should be between the winning counterparties. I do understand your argument about the load-serving entity has different regulatory limitations. I was thinking more about that. And I guess, yeah, so we've always viewed, and I think the design initially was developed, as a two-step process for distributing the CRRs that are backed by congestion revenue. And that's what setting the congestion limits to, the constraint limits to 75% is about. So at least currently, the auction is not a purely financial auction. I guess you agree with that. You're trying to make it into a purely financial auction. But I think there are, that limits the set of ISO or congestion revenue-backed CRRs that can be transacted. That's what we mean by technical points. All right, so we have one question on the phone before we move on. Yeah, and I think what we'll do is we'll take that question, then we'll break for lunch. Okay, yeah, and then we can go over the technical points, which maybe they're uncontroversial and that the controversy is more over what, you know, these points we've been discussing, but we'll find out. All right, but first, operator, can we take the question on the phone? Okay, go ahead. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hi, this is Doug Bocciniani from Flynn Resource Consultants. I think one of the reasons why you don't see more participation in the auction in terms of unwinding CRRs is that the LSEs only receive a fraction of their monthly or seasonal eligible quantity because, you know, that's a key limitation on what they can nominate. And, you know, so I think if you were going down this route where you're trying to create an incentive for LSEs to sell in an auction, you'd have to do something like, you know, increase the seasonal eligible quantity, you know, so they could nominate multiples of the quantity. That would result in them having more allocated CRRs. And then most of them have risk management guidelines that say, okay, now, you know, you can't be overhedged. So they'd be motivated to unwind those CRRs that exceeded their load in the auction. I think that could at least partially address the concern that you're raising. It wouldn't address this issue about, you know, getting, not having allocated CRRs to the intertice, for example. You'd have to change the rules. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. All right. At this point, we're going to break for lunch, and we'll finish this presentation afterwards. And Dr. Harvey also has a presentation. I'm sure there will be a lot more discussion. How much time do you think we need for lunch? Not the full hour. Pardon me? Forty-five minutes. So let's meet again at 5 after 1. Thank you.
So 105 operator will be starting again uh, shortly after the hour of one o'clock. Okay. 